Maybe it wasn't recording. So thanks, Jake. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. Okay. So let's start as we think about the book of Daniel. Let's think by think by considering the author. Okay. Um, Daniel names himself as the author of the book. I just kind of like to introduce a couple of basic things when we start out studying a new book. Um, one, it's just, why do we think Daniel's the author of this? Well, Daniel makes it pretty easy on us. He names himself as the author. If you look at passages like Daniel 7 and verse 15, it says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. And then in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 15, then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning. And so Daniel makes it very easy for us to know who the author of this book is. Uh, several other citations um, point out his authorship as well. Um, you'll also notice, though, when you study the New Testament, that Jesus identifies Daniel as the author of this work as well. Uh, Gleason Archer writes a book called A Survey of Old Testament Introduction. And by the way, if you want a good survey of the Old Testament, I like Gleason Archer's survey. Some some scholars who survey the Old Testament, they there's a lot of liberal scholars, there's a lot of progressive scholars who uh, try to uh, kind of attack the authority of the Old Testament. Gleason's a very conservative scholar, and uh, he's actually going to give you some really good reasons uh, why um, you know, why certain works are dated at certain times and why actually the liberal scholars are wrong about their dating. Um, and so this is just, I like to use his survey here, but he says, we have the clear testimony of the Lord Jesus himself in the Olivet Discourse. In Matthew 24, 15, he refers to the abomination of desolation spoken of through Daniel the prophet. And the phrase abomination of desolation occurs three times in Daniel, chapter 9, chapter 11, chapter 12. We can only conclude that he, that's Christ, believed the historic Daniel to be the personal author of the prophecies containing this phrase. And so Daniel's the author. Um, Ezekiel is a contemporary of Daniel, and he refers to Daniel three times in his prophecy as a real and a well-known character of the captivity. In Ezekiel 14, in verse 14, he mentions Daniel he mentions him in Ezekiel 14 and verse 20, and then also in chapter 28. So we've got several things that point to Daniel as the author of this work. Um, notice this also, which I think is an interesting quote from Josephus, because Josephus is actually a first century Jewish historian, refers back to Daniel as the author, as well as the events that take place in this work. Um, he writes in Antiquities of the Jews, now Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, took some of the most noble of the Jews that were children and the kinsmen of Zedekiah, their king, such as were remarkable for their beauty of their bodies and comeliness of their countenances and delivered them into the hands of tutors and to the improvement to be made by them. He also made some of them to be eunuchs, which course he took also with those of other nations whom he had taken in the flower of their age and afforded them their diet from his own table, uh, which this goes just kind of hand in hand with what you read in Daniel chapter one, which is why I find it interesting. Um, he taught them the learning of the Chaldeans, and they had now exercised themselves sufficiently in that wisdom, which he had ordered they should apply themselves to. He goes on to say, now among these were four of the family of Zedekiah, um, of most excellent dispositions, the one of whom was called Daniel. Now this is very interesting to me as well, because a little bit of information is brought out by Josephus that we don't necessarily get from the biblical text, and that is that Daniel was a relative of King Zedekiah. So Daniel was related to royalty. Um, and so the other one it says was called Ananias, another Misael, the fourth Azarias, the king of Babylon changed their names, which we read in the first chapter. Daniel he called Balthazar, Ananias, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azarias, Abednego. Uh, these the king had in esteem and continued to love because of the very excellent temper they were of and because of their application to learning and the progress they had made in wisdom. So Josephus, um, it's interesting, his history, which is from the first century, 
uh, several centuries after the time of Daniel, but uh, his history goes very much hand in hand with what we read quite a bit in the first chapter, right? So the author's Daniel. Um, Daniel's mentioned not just in the Bible, but also in by other works of history. Well, what's the theme of Daniel? Why is it important for us to study Daniel? Well, one of the things that I actually mentioned when everybody was signing on, um, and, and I think there was a little bit of chatter about what's going on in our nation today, um, and I think it's very applicable that the principle that we find in the book of Daniel is also a principle that we need to remember today, and that is that God rules in the kingdoms of men. God rules. Uh, we see the rule of God manifested in the days of the kings of the Babylonians, of the Medes, and of the Persians. It didn't matter if Nebuchadnezzar was king, or Belshazzar was king, or Darius, or Cyrus. Uh, God was in control. And as powerful as those kings might have thought themselves to be, or considered themselves to be, as the kings of very powerful nations— God ultimately shows that he is in control and his will will be done. Um, Daniel foretold things also that were to occur in the days of the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans, but especially in what one of our focuses was going to be was the establishment of God's kingdom. And the reason why we chose to study Daniel this quarter is because our theme this year is the church Christ built. We're thinking about the establishment of the kingdom of God, the church, okay? Christ is the head of the church. Another way we phrase that, Christ is the king of the kingdom. And after his death, burial, and resurrection, he is exalted as king. And that prediction that there would be a king who would reign on a throne, and that throne would last forever, that's a prediction in several Old Testament books, but most definitely in the book of Daniel. Daniel predicts the establishment of God's kingdoms. He foretells things that will happen among the Persian Empire and in the, among the Greeks, finally among the Romans, and during the days of the Roman Empire, Daniel predicts a kingdom will be established that will last forever. And that's somewhat why we're studying this Old Testament book today, even though our theme is about the church Christ built this year, because this Old Testament book predicts uh, the planting of that church. So that's some of our basic introductory stuff here. Let's get a little bit into the questions for a moment. Um, and let's just think about uh, this area that's called Babylon, okay? Verse one says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, right? I want you to go back and think about this area called Babylon. What was the first Bible name for the land that later became known as Babylonia? That's our first question, and I'm going to show you these two passages up on the screen. You find it in Genesis 10 and verse 10, and Genesis chapter 11 and verse 2. In Genesis 10, all the way back in Genesis 10, it says the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erek, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar, okay? And so, this area, Babel, um, was in the land of Shinar. It says in verse chapter 11, verse 2, as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And that's where they build the Tower of Babel in the land of Shinar. Can you hear that Babel sounds a lot like Babylon? Can you see how that name would have just kind of easily been uh, slowly, uh, slightly changed, just like some of our names do? And so the land of Shinar uh, is the original name for what is called in the days of Daniel, Babylon. Um, there's a second Bible name, though, before we get to Babylon. Um, and so take a look in Jeremiah 24, verse 5. It says in chapter 24, verse 5, as well as chapter 25, verse 12, it says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so I will regard as good the exiles from Judah, where did the Judah exiles go? Well, they had been sent away from this place to the land of the Chaldeans, okay? Um, land of the Chaldeans. That's another name for this, the Babylonians. In fact, take a look at 2512, and you find those, both of those terms used. 
It says, after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans. And I think this is helpful for us to know at the very start here, because whenever you see Shinar, whenever you see Chaldea in the Bible, or maybe you see Babylon or Babylonia, we're talking about the same area. We're really talking about largely the same people. Uh, there's just various names that are given to those different peoples. And that helps us kind of understand um, in scripture when those names come up, what people group we're talking about. Okay, so the, the, the Chaldeans, same thing as the Babylonians, if you will. Um, take a look at Ezekiel 12, verse 13, and you see also uh, how that's borne out. It says, I will bring him to Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans, yet he shall not see it, he shall die there. And so that's the second Bible name. Uh, take a look at this map, and this might help us understand kind of the area. Um, when we're talking about the Babylonian Empire. Well, depending upon when we're talking about the Babylonian Empire, the borders of that empire may have been vastly different at certain times in history. If you look at the gray area, that would be around 1700 BC during the time of Hammurabi, the Babylonian Empire uh, was, was far smaller than it was during the time of Daniel, during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, this gray area, uh, some of the cities that maybe we've heard of, we've heard of Susa. Um, we've heard of, uh, you hear Susa, for example, in uh, the book of Nehemiah. Uh, Babylon is certainly a major city, and that would be the capital of the Babylonian Empire. Um, Nineveh, if you're thinking about where's, where's Nineveh, um, there's, there's Nineveh. That's where that's where Jonah was to go and preach. Um, and so all of this would be considered the Babylonian Empire with Hammurabi. But notice how Nebuchadnezzar really expands that empire. And he takes over really the area that was generally considered Canaan's land um, in previous times. It was the area that was given to the people of God, the nation of Israel. But he comes and defeats those places. Um, he overtakes the Assyrians. He becomes kind of the big player in this area uh, during this time frame. And he eventually overtakes the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, puts them all in exile. And all of this becomes what would be considered the Babylonian Empire. Now take a look at the next map. And notice with me, when we look at a modern map of this area, what areas we would be talking about today. Okay. Okay. Uh, if you, if this, this map is a, is a lot more blown out. Just take a look at this one. Look at Babylon right here. We have the Persian Gulf here. Babylon right here. Now take a look again. Persian Gulf right here. It's a little further up on this map. The same area that Babylon was. What city is there now? We're talking about Baghdad, Iraq. The Babylonian Empire then would have made up what today is Iraq, parts of Iran, parts of Turkey, parts of Syria, parts of Saudi Arabia and Jordan and Israel and Lebanon. Um, are we still fighting in those areas today? <laughs> Do they still have wars repeatedly all the time? Was, uh, they, they were fighting back in Nebuchadnezzar's day. Uh, they're still fighting today, but I just wanted you to see this just so you can kind of get a picture. Uh, Babylon would have been near the area of modern day Baghdad, uh, which would be a city we're pretty familiar with because of the Persian Gulf Wars and, and how that got mentioned quite a bit during that time frame. If you're old enough to remember that. Some of you may not be. I'm looking at Jake and Danny and you, you may not remember the Persian Gulf Wars. I don't know. I'm dating myself. All right. So, um, can anybody share any information? Uh, I, I didn't want to get too deep into history because we have a lot more to cover actually here, but anybody have anything that they want to share about Babylon and the Babylonian Empire from this time period? Anything that you can think of? Josh, I looked it up and it said there's 14 square miles, the city. There's the okay. Euphrates ran through the middle of it. Yeah. And yeah, that's the um, Burton, one of the seven wonders. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Great, that's some great information. One of the seven ancient wonders of the world was the Gardens of Babylon. Uh, it was a walled city. Uh, that's that's going to be very pertinent when we get to this section where they get overtaken because they thought that they were impenetrable. They didn't think anybody would ever be able to defeat them. They thought that their city was so safe and so secure and uh, that they would never be defeated. It's very interesting, by the way, that we're studying that today, considering our capital city is being somewhat overrun at the moment. Um, you know, we, we need to be careful not to become overly confident, overly arrogant, that we could never be defeated, that there could never be a downfall. Um, and Babylon had that, that mindset, if you will. Um, I'll say, okay, so, so good points. We'll get a little bit more into some history as we go through all of the lessons, but um, let's take a look at our next question. I, I want to review with you. I want you to understand where we are in the history of the Bible. Um, and so I want to review some of the phases of the Babylonian domination of Judah. Um, it's easy to think that you know, just one day, the Babylonian army came into Judah, defeated it the next day, and then all of a sudden, just within, you know, a week, uh, the city of Judah, everybody got taken captive, they got defeated, and all of a sudden, the Babylonians were overtaking it. But that is not generally how the country gets defeated and overtaken. It's usually a process. It's a progression. It takes time. Um, it begins um, at a certain point, and then it will eventually end at a certain point with total domination. And we see in 606 BC the beginning of it. So quick question, in 606 BC, who was the king in Judah, and what happened to the people of Judah during this phase? Anybody know who the king was? Jehoiakim. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think if you read Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, I believe Daniel 1 is describing that first phase of Babylonian domination. And I believe that's when Daniel and his friends got taken into captivity during that first phase. Take a look at verses 1 and 2 of Daniel 1, which should be on your screen. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to, what, what phrase do you see there? The land of Shinar. What's the land of Shinar? It's just another phrase for the Babylonian empire, the Chaldeans. Um, he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. And so Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 is describing phase 1 of the Babylonians conquering uh, Judah. Take a look at 2 Chronicles 36, and I want to read to you a pretty lengthy text here, which really describes all of the phases. Uh, 2 Chronicles 36, 5 through 21. So Jehoiakim, it says, and by the way, this is the last chapter of Chronicles. So to put this in a biblical context, we've, we've already gone through uh, Moses crossing the Red Sea and waiting in the wilderness. We've already seen Joshua cross over the Jordan and enter into Canaan's land. We've seen Joshua begin to defeat Canaan's land, but then eventually uh, the people are ruled by judges. And of course, the nation of Israel has its peaks and its valleys during the, the, the time of the judges. They get tired of being ruled by judges. Then they want kings. So we have the united kingdom of Saul, of David, of Solomon. And then after Solomon is finished, the kingdom divides between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. There is a northern kingdom of Israel. There's the southern kingdom of Judah. And many, many kings rule over uh, the northern kingdom and southern kingdom for a while. The northern kingdom is taken into captivity by the Assyrians a few years prior and then later, the southern kingdom, who holds its own a little longer, but the southern kingdom is eventually taken into captivity as well. And this is at the very end of, if you will, the, the good old days of the southern kingdom, um, right before they're taken into captivity for 70 years. 
So Jehoiakim, it says, was 25 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. And against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also carried part of the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his palace in Babylon. Does this agree with what we read in Daniel? Yes, it does. Verse 2 told us that he took the vessels. And that's what Chronicles tells us as well. The Bible agrees with itself. Um, it says in verse 8, Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and the abominations that he did, what was found against him, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah, and Jehoiachin, his son, reigned in his place. Okay, so Jehoiakim was the king probably when Daniel was taken into captivity. And then we have Jehoiachin. In the spring of the year, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the precious vessels of the house of the Lord and made his brother Zedekiah king over Judah and Jerusalem. So we have another king. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet. Okay, that's going to be important. That'll come up in one of our questions here in a minute. But Jeremiah basically told Zedekiah he needed to repent, and this would indicate he didn't listen to Jeremiah. It says in verse 13, he rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar. That's a big no-no. King Nebuchadnezzar was much more powerful than Zedekiah. And um, it says he stiffened his neck, he hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. And all the officers of the priests and the people Likewise, were exceedingly unfaithful, following all the abominations of the nations. They polluted the house of the Lord that he had made holy in Jerusalem. So here's the situation in Jerusalem. Uh, evil kings, even the priests have become evil. Things were getting incredibly corrupt. And because of that, God is punishing his holy nation uh, and kicking them out of the land that he had once promised them. It says, the Lord... And this is verse 16. The Lord, the God of their father, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no remedy. Therefore, he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans. Now, I want you to see, we've seen the land of Shinar, we've seen Babylon, and now we've seen the Chaldeans all in this context. All different names are used. And it says, the king killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or aged. He gave them all into his hand. Okay. And as we continue reading, keep having to move my screen over here. Um, it says, all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem. Now that's very important in later history, right? Because eventually, after 70 years of captivity, God is going to allow his people to go back to Jerusalem, rebuild the temple. Nehemiah is going to come back and rebuild the wall. But this is where we see it got destroyed by the king of Babylon and his army. And he took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword. They became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbath. All the days it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Right? Very important text for us to consider because it sets up where we are in the book of Daniel. It also tells you what Daniel and his family had just gone through. Daniel was living in a time where priests were corrupt. Daniel was living in a time where the kings were said to be evil people who were not doing the will of the Lord. Daniel was living in a time where he and his Comrades had been taken into captivity. Daniel was living in a time where, even though he was in Babylon, somewhat safe, but a slave, if you will, for the, for the nation. 
He was living in a time where a lot of his friends and his relatives and his, and his countrymen were being killed back home in Jerusalem. So it's a terrible, terrible time. And yet one of the lessons I really want you to take home is that even though Daniel lived during a time full of corruption, he still always did the right thing. And so don't use the world or don't use people who are in positions of power like the kings and the priests as excuses for doing the wrong thing. Be like Daniel, who does the right thing, even though other people may do the wrong thing. And I think that's one of the great lessons of Daniel. Now, Matthew Riley, you had your hand raised. Yeah, just wanted to kind of uh, add something in with that when we talked about all the things that, you know, leading into the captivity, I mean, is you consider this, and I'd like to suggest is that this goes back all the way even to looking at the flood. And when God sees his people or his children doing evil, he does a form of purification. And this is just another step in that, you know, line where he see all the evil that the kings were doing and all the people were doing. And by giving them over into captivity, it's actually a purification of what they were doing and, and, and bringing them back. Because as you mentioned, then when they do come back into Jerusalem, he brings everything back to order with that. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to kind of, you know, bring that to our, our, our ideas and things. I think that's a great point. It's a great point. Um, sometimes hard times purify us. They refine us. Uh, they strengthen us. They, they wake us up. Um, and, uh, that I believe that that may very well be the case, was the case in the days of Daniel. Um, God had had enough with the evil, and uh, he punishes Israel, and yet he always saves a remnant. There's a remnant who wants to do the right thing. Daniel and his friends are among that remnant, but we're going to find when they return back to Jerusalem, there's thousands who are still a part of that remnant, um, who have all gone through a very difficult time for 70 years in captivity. All right. Um, so going back to our question four here, uh, we've got three major phases that we read about in, in Chronicles and in Kings. First phase is 606 BC, and that's when I believe Daniel was taken into captivity. Second phase, uh, would, would the, the next phase would be 597 BC. Uh, and then in 586 BC, there's a final phase where whoever's left either gets killed or if they escape, they become slaves of Babylon. And at that point, the city is destroyed completely, even the temple, even the holy places, the walls are burnt down. There is no more resistance at that point. They are completely owned by Babylon. Um, and it's gonna be 70 years before they get to return at the word of Cyrus. Okay, so moving on to question five here, Jeremiah 52, describes the events that occurred in 586 BC. Okay, this starts in 606 BC, then we have phase two, then we have the last phase. And uh, based on the dates listed in this text, how long does this attack upon Jerusalem last? Take a look at the dates here. Uh, Jeremiah 52, four through seven says this. In the ninth year of his reign, in the 10th month, on the 10th day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And they built siege works all around it. So the city was besieged till the 11th year of King Zedekiah. Okay, what I want you to see is this wasn't like an overnight conquering of Jerusalem. Um, this didn't just happen. This was a progression. In fact, even during the last phase, when there's only a a, a few people left from Jerusalem um, in the city, they still had to wait two to three years before they fully conquered it. And it says on the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city. When you besiege a city, you basically don't let food in and you don't let people out to go get food. So you starve people to death. And that's how they defeated them. And the Jews, by the way, extremely stubborn that they allowed themselves to be starved for two plus years. And it says it got to the point where there was no food for the people of the land and there was a breach made in the city. All the men of war fled and went out by, by a gate 
and the Chaldeans were around the city and they went in the direction and of the city and conquered it. Um, let's think about just, just one more thing before we get into Daniel concerning the kings. What happened to King Zedekiah? There's something unique that happens to him. What's, what, what does Jeremiah 52 tell us happens to King Zedekiah? The last king, if you will, of uh, the southern kingdom. He killed his sons in front of him and gouged out his eyes. So think about that. King Zedekiah, the last thing that he ever sees are his sons being killed. They allow him to watch that. And then they pluck his eyes out. They gouge his eyes out. The last thing he ever sees with his eyes are his own sons dying in front of him. And then he's blinded by the king. This is a very evil nation who's reigning. And God is using that evil nation to accomplish his will and punishment against his people. But eventually that evil nation will also be punished. All right, take a look at Jeremiah 52. And that's where we read this. This helps us to see all that Daniel would have heard of and would have experienced and his countrymen would have experienced right before and during the time he's taken to Babylon. The king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, slaughtered all the officials of Judah at Riblah. He put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him in chains, took him to Babylon and put him in prison till the day of his death. So this is what's going on in Daniel's nation among his his people. Uh, and what year was Jehoiakim, the, the king of Judah, in Daniel 1 1? I think we've already talked about that. I think that'd be around 606 BC. And if that was the case, Daniel and his friends would have been taken as elite captives to Babylon during the first round of Nebuchadnezzar's attacks upon Jerusalem. Um, take a look here at this chart. Uh, you've got the Babylonian Empire up here on the top left. Uh, Nabopolassar reigns before Nebuchadnezzar, 605, 606 BC is when Nebuchadnezzar begins to reign. Notice he reigns for a very long time, till about 562 BC. So Daniel would have been working under Nebuchadnezzar in the kingdom of Babylon for a very large period of time. Um, so would have had time to get to know Nebuchadnezzar very well, over 40 years. He's working with him until Belshazzar takes over. And then Belshazzar is eventually defeated by Cyrus and the Medo-Persians take over. All of this happens during the lifetime of Daniel. So Daniel uh, has close relationship with the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, then with Belshazzar, and then also uh, near the beginning of Cyrus and Darius the Mede's time. This also, uh, take a look here, this, this helps us to see who, is he, who he's a contemporary with in terms of the prophets. He's a contemporary with Jeremiah, who was prophesying before Daniel got taken to Babylon and was offering warnings, but also during the time Daniel was in Babylon. And he's also a contemporary with Ezekiel um, as well. So those works would have been written uh, in similar time frames. All right. Uh, it's Jeremiah who tells Hezekiah, right, that uh, everything you have is going to be taken to Babylon. And uh, which king sins, though, was God going to punish Israel? Actually, it wasn't Jehoiakim, it wasn't Jehoiachin, it wasn't Zedekiah either. For which king's sins was God going to punish Israel? Well, the answer to that would be in 2 Kings 21. Take a look. It says in verse 10, The Lord said by his servants, the prophets, because Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these abominations and has done things more evil than all that the Amorites did her before him and has made Judah to sin with his idols, Thus says the Lord, I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such disaster that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria. Um, it says, basically, I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. I will forsake the remnant of my heritage, give them into the hand of their enemies. They shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies because... They have done what is evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger. And Manasseh shed much innocent blood. Um, he had filled Jerusalem from one end of the other uh, with innocent blood. So because of Manasseh's sins, God says, I'm going to punish. And it takes a while, uh, but he does punish 
Israel. And Daniel is, is part of that punishment. Him being taken as a captive to Babylon is, is part of God's punishment uh, upon the people. Now, let's think about, though, despite the difficulties Daniel faced, despite the history that Daniel would have been a part of, what is it about Daniel that gives him some special privilege in the king's palace? What is the king looking for in his Israelite recruits? Take a look at verses three and four. I think I've got it here. There we go. The king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, Okay, and we mentioned earlier that Josephus notes, note, notice, notes that Daniel is part of the royal family. He wanted some of those people who are youths without blemish, of good appearance, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, competent to stand in the king's palace and teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. So what can we conclude about Daniel if we realize that the king wanted a, a certain caliber of people who could serve in his kingdom. What can we conclude about Daniel? What was Daniel like then and his friends? They definitely met the criteria, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. Use without blemish. Must have been some good looking young men, skillful in wisdom. So they're viewed as intelligent. They must have been good students. They were quick learners, and they were competent to stand in the king's palace. And so uh, Nebuchadnezzar sees some good in some of these people who were Israelites, and he says, hey, I can use them for my nation for good. Uh, notice that we've got a chat here. Let me pull that up if I can. Yeah, Mark says they were people of a higher standard. And that's who the king wanted serving in his kingdom. So basically, he takes the best and the brightest out of Jerusalem and out of Judah. And he leaves the rest for a while, but he comes back and he, he conquers the rest of the nation in future years. I hear somebody unmuting themselves. Yeah, Josh, I was just going to say, right, we just read that that this nation of Judah, right, was going to become a spoil for their enemies, right, that they were going to become basically a, a virtue that their enemies had to exploit now that they've taken them from, right, and this is, you know, one manifestation of that, right, one one benefit you get when you conquer a nation is you get their best and brightest, right, and we, I mean, we see that in modern times, right, after the fall of the German Empire, right, their scientists defect to other countries and uh, some some people who have you know talents are, are then you know basically scrapped up by the conquering nations, and so that that you know thing that God just said was going to happen. This is that happening, right? We see that these people are becoming the spoils now of of this nation that conquered them. Good point. Good point. Maybe one of the very basic lessons for us: if if anything ever happens in the U.S., um, you better make sure you're making good grades and getting yourself some skills so you can be useful somewhere else and to someone else. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, that's that's one of the things that saved their skin. They were people who had uh, been well educated and were quick learners. Um, now, last question is this, then, because all we've done is introduce. We're actually going to study the rest of chapter one. I think there's some good moral lessons we can learn from chapter one. So I, I, didn't, I knew I wasn't going to have enough time to cover everything in one class without really wearing you out. But we sometimes hear people say, I don't want to raise children in an ungodly culture. And I, and I get that. I, I get that sentiment. But I just want you to think about Daniel and realize that just because the culture is ungodly does not mean things are hopeless. So as we consider Daniel... Does an ungodly culture mean God can not still use us and our children for his purposes? And how can we use a case study of Daniel to respond to, to this fear? How can Daniel, when you get that thought in your head and, and you start feeling like that, you feel weighed down by that, 
How can Daniel be an encouragement to you? Something that you can study to strengthen you as a parent and even your children when they feel discouraged. So the first thing I would say is, you know, Jesus said the way is narrow. So it's, we're never going to be in a, a godly culture. You know, if you look at it, Jesus tells us that Christians are the minority, right? We're never going to be in a, a perfect utopian culture where everyone is, is serving God. It's not going to happen, right? We, we are the minority. And so we sit there and we look at that and we, you know, we see a lot of Old Testament examples, obviously Daniel being one of them, um, where, you know, even in the face of ungodliness, we can stand strong and we can do what we need to do to respond to that. But I, I think if we look at that and, and we realize there's never going to be a time in history and there's never been a time in history where we could say, oh, this is a godly culture at this point. You know, it, it, if we just look at culture, it's, it's never happened, then it won't happen. Mm-hmm. Good thought. Um, Mary Beth Henderson puts in the chat box, God is the God of the universe not any one country, and faithful parents are the key. That's, that's a great point. There are people living in many other cultures right now that uh, are raising children, and, and um, godly parents are the key. Let's see. Jonna had a hand up. Are you there? Maybe that was an accident. All right. Anybody else have something they want to add to this? Oh, she says okay. accident in the chat box. <laughs> hey, Josh. Hey. Hey, yeah. Also, something that I thought about is when, you know, someone's godly in an ungodly culture, you you kind of stick out like a sore thumb. And that that actually kind of is a good thing in a way. And that, right, it's kind of like a inherent kind of pedestal or something, a way that you stick out so that, you know, that message can get across because that's different, right? That's different than what everybody else is doing so in some ways that kind of works to god's favor in that way and we can kind of see that with with daniel right he was different than than everyone he was around or at least not obviously not shadrach meshach and abednego but the rest of um the babylon culture right Mm -hmm. yeah and and i think that's a great point that's going to come up later is that people really noticed daniel they noticed he was different. In fact, they had to create laws because they knew that he would never do something that was unlawful or immoral. So they had to create laws just to try to get him in trouble because he had such an upstanding character. And that's one of the beautiful things about Daniel. So instead of seeing this as um, you know, something that can't be overcome, see this as an opportunity. Instead of thinking pessimistically, Things are so bad, we're never going to, no, think optimistically. This is an opportunity to shine, to demonstrate godliness to an ungodly world. Leslie mentions in the chat box, in the darkest places, one light shines bright. And Mark mentioned something very similar. He says, we can be a good influence in a dark world. And Matthew Riley says, we have the freedom to choose how we react to bad situations. That's a great point. Uh, Daniel didn't give up. Daniel didn't use this as an opportunity to quit or just assimilate to his culture. Uh, Daniel chose to still be godly and and still be God-fearing despite the situation. Josh, um, I mean, yet just to to chime in to that point, right? That's been true since the beginning of the world, right? That we, you know, in the Garden of Eden, there was temptation afoot for them. And, you know, we think now maybe the ratio of, of temptation and not temptation has changed in our world, right? And uh, sometimes, you know, may think that with or without evidence. But even then, right, God's expectation for them was, you know, to, to be fruitful and to live life and to, to have descendants, right? And to, to continue to, uh, you know, hopefully perpetuate his kingdom and live out his will on the earth. And, I, you know, I, I don't think that there's really a reason for us to believe that his expectation has changed, right? It's not that the temptation was really, uh, you know, a factor for them. They were still expected to, to obey God and, and to, you know, sp- you know, spread out on the earth, basically. Um, you know, so now for us, I, I think that's still kind of the expectation for us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so uh, perhaps we need to think a little bit differently. Um, you know, don't, uh, don't quit. Don't think things are hopeless. Um, Look at tough situations, difficult situations, and say, 
now's the time to step up. Now's the time to show the world or, you know, my classroom or um, my workplace or my neighborhood. Well, this is how Christians act during these difficult, dark times. And uh, we're still going to act with dignity and integrity and, uh, and respect. Um, and uh, we're, we're not going to assimilate. So good, good thoughts, everybody. There's a couple of preachable lessons. I'm going to include this at the end of our lesson here, but just a couple of pre preachable lessons that I think can come from this. And that is, number one, we can overcome our past no matter how dreadful. Uh, Daniel has a very dark past, even though he was part of royalty, he was part of a very evil royalty. Uh, and yet he was different. And even though he was part of a nation who was taken into captivity, uh, he overcame. And he's, he still is used as a very powerful tool for God, uh, despite a very dark time. And then finally, if we don't act as God's vessels, I think it's interesting that the king of Babylon comes to the temple, takes the vessels out of the temple, and uses them in his pagan temple. And I think there's a lesson there for us that if we as individuals don't act as though we are God's vessels, because the New Testament actually calls us vessels, then the world will start using us as their tool. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar does. Nebuchadnezzar says, well, um, you know, the priests aren't really using God's vessels in the way that God would have them to use it. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it back to my God. I'm going to use it the way I want to use it. If we don't train up our children to be God's vessels and to act in God's ways, then the world will start training up our children to act according to their ways, according to their will. So I think that's just a, a preachable lesson. Um, we are God's vessels, and our body is called his temple in the New Testament. And we choose whether or not we're going to be honorable vessels or dishonorable vessels in God's household. And that very term is used in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. Um, if you're an honorable vessel, you're going to be someone who makes yourself available to be filled and to be used by God's glory, uh, for God's glory. Um, so the challenge for us is this, and this is the take-home lesson that I offer to you with this kind of last point. Are you allowing God to use you as his vessel, or is your plate so full of the world that we've abandoned God's service and we're becoming captive to mammon? Uh, let God use you. As his vessel. Um, don't let the world use you. All right, that's all I've got. Any final comments or thoughts or questions as we finish up this introductory lesson? Uh, a thought that Danny had was that Zedekiah, the king, was basically used as a puppet king by Neb um we call him neb um so that's another way you know that on a personal level you know nations ungodly nations on uh satan you know that there's there's things out there that will take an individual and instead of that individual that was supposed to be purposed specifically for god for godly things for god's children and turn them into something um, terrible, or turn them into um, use, use the use their own temptations against them, uh, and for their own purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, it, it'd be it'd be interesting to think more about that relationship between Jehoiachin and then who, who then is removed, and then Zedekiah is put in place. Probably because you're right, Zedekiah was more of a puppet. Um, Jehoiachin says, I'm not going to pay taxes to you. I'm not going to let you come in here. Well, Nebuchadnezzar, oh, yes, you are. And I'm going to remove you as king. I'm going to put Zedekiah in as king. And you're right. Zedekiah just played along with Nebuchadnezzar as long as he could to stay there and king and try to live in comfort. Eventually, he's punished too. Um, and so that's, that's, that's a good point. Uh, all right. Well, guys, I'm going to offer 
prayer as we close, and then we'll stick around here for a minute. Um, if anybody has anything else to say or any prayer requests or any, any final questions, but uh, take a moment to pray with me, and we'll go to Lord in prayer. Our God and our Father in heaven, we are so thankful to you for your word that we've been able to study tonight. We're thankful for the lessons that we can gain from a study of your word. And we, we pray, Lord, as we think about the rebellion of your people in the days of the kings, and we think about the punishment that, that came upon them, uh, we, we pray, Lord, that we will have hearts not of rebellion, but of humble obedience to your will and to your word, knowing that you're only long-suffering for so long. So help us to learn from that, from what we've studied here tonight. And help us to learn that despite the fact we may live in an evil world where times are, are frightening, where it seems as though immorality is rampant, where rebellion is so common, help us to realize from Daniel that we can be different, that we can still be servants of yours, we can still trust you, we, we still have the power to do your will, and, and you can still bless us and use us as we strive to do so. So help us to learn from him. Help us to continue to learn from him as we go through this study. Help us to learn, most importantly, in the, the God who ruled in the kingdoms of men during the days of Daniel. Help us to trust in you and to trust in your will and to know that even though the situation may look dim and it may look grim, uh, help us to realize that, that you have a plan and a purpose through all of this um, as you, you strive to bring your people in submission and subjection to you. So help us to learn to think about these things as we think about your word and help us to encourage one another as we study it. Help us as a church, help those who are struggling physically, those who are struggling in grief right now. Uh, be with Brother Wilcox in the hospital, be with his family, be with the Shaners, uh, be with the Campbell family who uh, has lost a, a, a loved one. Um, just be with all of them and be with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat>